Hello, everybody. We're going to start in a couple of minutes. Could I ask the panelists for this session to come up on stage, please? Now, I think oh, apart from Ms. Yang Shu Li, all the panelists will be should be here. So we have Valtteri, Ratia, Yoncha, uh, Ukram. Yes. Yeah. Oh, by, by the way, panelists, do not touch the bottom. Do not. They will control it from there. Oh. No, no, no. <laughs> My colleagues in the audio visual department said, "Please tell the panelists not to touch the bottom of the microphone." <laughs> I think it was Marco who delivered this message. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. No, no. It was very good because you were trying. Okay. Who wants water? Anybody? Vasa. Yeah. Vasa. Für dich. Well, yeah, yeah, here. Gibt's Wasser? Auch, um, etwas? Nein? Agua? The low? Oui? Yes? Ah. This one I will take, and the rest take. Oh, sorry. And voila. Thank you. Got it. Aha. A crim? Some water? No? Okay. Taste some water? Yes. Wonderful, yes. So, how are you? I'll be starting with you shortly. Thank you very much, everybody. I think. Oh, so we need to be equidistant. A little bit more, okay. Thank you very much. Perfect, yes. Thank you, everybody. Um, welcome to this session. It's another World Forestry Week special event. And the title, as you'll know, because you are here, is Beyond Numbers Income employment and decent work in forestry. Well, what does this mean? We'll explain during this session. It's organized by uh, the Food and Agriculture Organization, so FAO of the UN, in collaboration with the International Labour Organization, the ILO, and UNICE, the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe. Okay, so a collaboration of the three. We're going to present recent evidence on forest contribution to economies. We'll be discussing lies behind main aggregates. Now, is my microphone dipping in and out? So we'll hear more uh, about evidence published firsthand on the of the World Forest 2022. This is the, one of the key documents during this week, particularly the figures on forest total contributions to national economies and on formal and informal employment. You'll have heard the figure, 33 million jobs. What does that really mean? We'll also look and discuss uh, how megatrends, global megatrends like climate change and demographic shifts, what's happening within countries and across countries, how is that affecting work in forestry, and then the needs to adapt occupational safety and health if we want to ensure decent work in the future in forestries. So you've seen, we've got the panelists here on my left and on my right, and I'll be introducing them in turn. But to get us started, to frame the discussion, I'm delighted to invite Mr. Ukram Yaziji, Deputy Chief of the UNECE File Forestry and Timber Section, to deliver his opening remarks. And I, I understand, uh, Mr. Yaziji, that you have more than 30 years of experience in forest management, policy, project development and implementation. You're based in Geneva. We are in safe hands. Please, Akram, the floor is yours. Oh, come on, please. Yes. Is it open? Yes, it should be on. Yes? Yes. Yeah. Yes. 
Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. I have a honor to welcome you today on behalf of the three organizations, FAO, ILO, and UNEC. Let me start my remarks by thanking my colleagues for joining forces to organize this important event and for our decades-long cooperation on the topic of employment in the forest sector. This will shed a light on the role of forest and forest sector in national economies and will tell us in what way the income, employment and decent work in forestry impact human lives and well-being. A warm welcome to our speakers representing other organizations and institutions who are important partners for us to better understand trends in income, employment and decent work in forest and ways to measure it. As you all know, forests generate wealth and the millions of jobs around the, the world. But the forest sector's economic contribution may be much larger. The sector is informal in many countries of the world, and therefore its value remains largely unreported. It's estimated that more than half of the world's economic production depends on ecosystem services, including those from forest, and this will likely increase as the demand for forest products grows, progressing towards a sustainable growth and a bio-based circular economy. The presentation of the background studies prepared for the State of the World, for, uh, World Forest 2022 will provide us with information on forest total contribution to the national economies and on formal and informal employment. The transition towards sustainable development and a sustainable bioeconomy offers new horizons that bring new opportunities for the sector. In this context, the sustainability of forest sector jobs is becoming critical for future. Without a workforce employed under the decent condition, the future of forestry is at stake and with it, all the benefits of the forest to entire society. Globalization, digitalization, and changing society and the changing labor market influence to the forest sector as well. The diversification of tasks and the new technologies will dominate our future, and we have to start with a reformed forestry education and training to attract the young generation to the sector and make our workforce future-proof. We will therefore discuss today how global macro trends will affect the future of forestry work based on the finding of, uh, of an upcoming FAO, ILO, UNEC joint study. Today, new job opportunities are enhancing all forestry ecosystem functions. The forest workforce will need to be much more aware of their work's environmental and social impact and sustainable development concept. At the same time, job stability, remuneration, working condition, informal work, outsourcing to the contractors or the possible involvement of the migrant work in the sector cannot be overlooked. All these topics we will, uh, will be discussed from the perspective of different forestry actors of different forest contexts and continents. This discussion promises to be very thought-provoking. So, thank you very much uh, again for your participation, for your contribution. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed for that excellent introduction. You've set us a very heavy task here because you said all these topics will be discussed. Let's see what we can do in the next hour and a quarter or so because uh, looking at the dynamics you've outlined here, your sustainability, uh, globalization, jobs for young people especially, future-proofing the industry, remuneration, working conditions, all of these things you've set us to discuss over the next hour or so and we'll do our best. So thank you very much for getting us off to such a strong start. Now, I'm delighted to introduce Madame Thais Linares Juvenal from FAO, coordinator of Chapter 2 of the State of the World's Forests, uh, SOFO 2022, uh, before uh, she gets to her feet. 
Um, just let me say a little bit about her. She's of Brazilian background. She's an economist, senior forestry officer, for those of you who don't know, and team leader, team leader of the Sustainable Forest Value Chain Innovation and Investment Stream in the Forestry Division of FAO. And um, Thais will be supported in her presentation by Dr. Yanshu Li, co-author of the paper, who's uh, joining virtually. In the paper, of course, the title is Forest Sector Contribution to National Economies 2015, the Direct, Indirect and Induced Effects on Value-Added Employment and Labour Income. Thais, over to you. Thank you very much, Henry. And I heard that my colleague Yan Shu is here with us on Zoom, so it would be good to have her on screen. Thank you. And uh, I cannot see Yan Shu yet. I cannot see myself, but good. I know she's here somewhere. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here today to launch this publication, Forest Sector Contribution to National Economies. Uh, this was a background paper uh, to the state of the world forests. So you have seen the main findings already regarding the contributions to GDP published in SOFO 2022. Uh, but today you're going to have more details. And if you read the publication, you'll have many more details there. So I want, before we move to the next slide, uh, and doctor, I can see Dr. Yan Shu Li now with us from University of Georgia. Uh, I would like to let you know that we have two other colleagues who made very important contributions with us. This is a team uh, uh, working on this methodology for quite some time. Um, so Mr. Richard, Dr. Richard Binmay from the University of Georgia as well, and our colleague in FAO, Natalia Formenton Cardoso, who is also is here in the plenary with us. So, the upcoming publication, which is being launched today, actually this afternoon, I believe you'll be able to access it in the FAO website, is bringing you new evidence on forest contribution to the national economies, uh, the value-added employment and labor income per forest subsector and per country, including the direct, indirect, and induced effects. Today, I'm going to walk you through the background to this work. This is work that has started already some time ago. The methodology we have used, uh, the results, the discussion, and the next steps. So the background. Our main question, our research question has always been, what is the contribution of the forest sector to the economy? So the beginning of this work, I can put the date on 2014. Uh, SOFO 2014, when it was first published the FAO estimations of the GDP, the forest contributions to global uh, uh, GDP. And, uh, and this was something that really made uh, a very important impact in the, in the whole forest and non-forest community. So it's one of our publications most cited here in FAO is exactly this SOFO 2014, including these uh, uh, data. So for 2018, we developed the methodology that we're presenting to you today, uh, and we uh, uh, worked with the multipliers, the economic multipliers approach, approach. And this is because if you see forestry uh, as a sector, uh, the contribution to GDP, many can say, okay, it's small. But we wanted to see what forestry is actually triggering in the rest of the economy. So we adopted these, uh, started working on this methodology uh, of the, on the economic multipliers to get the total contribution. So not only the contribution generated inside the forest sector, directly by the forest sector, but the contribution through other sectors as well. Um, then in 2019, we published the methodology and the results with the uh, uh, estimated the 2011 data. We published an article on for, uh, Forest Policy and Economics Journal with the total contribution to value-added employment and labor income in 2011. And uh, so for 2022, we then updated the uh, estimations for the data of 2015 
And if you notice, you know, that there is a, 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 a gap between, you know, when you have the data is because we need to have the data you see in the methodology for all countries uh, to run this model. So that's why we can never have very recent estimations. We get, we work with the most recent estimations available and uh, in 2021, when we developed these this most recent results, uh, the estimations were for, uh, the statistics we had available were for 2015. So with that, I hand over to Dr. Yanshu to present us the methodology. Yanshu, you have the floor. Thank you, please. Uh, thank you, guys. Uh, thank you, everyone. The key concept of the study is the ripple effects of the forest sector. The forest sector's production and sales activities affect more than just the factory itself. Uh, they create a ripple effect throughout the economy. And here's how the ripple effect works. Uh, the forest industry is directly hire workers and produce forest products, for example, lumber, plywood, pulp and paper products. And these are the direct effects of the forest sector. And when the forest industries uh, increase their uh, production, they need more raw materials, they hire more people. In, 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 uh, they need more raw materials, machinery, and equipment. And this stimulates extra production activities in those supplying sectors. And these are the indirect effects of the forest sector. And when the employees of the forest sector and the supplying sectors spend their income locally, for example, going to stores, local stores, restaurants, hospitals, and those, it generates uh, extra activities in those sectors, and these are the induced effects of the forest sector. Therefore, when we estimate the total contribution of the forest sector, we, it's important uh, not just looking at the direct impacts of the forest sector itself, but also looking at the additional economic activities and jobs supported um, in other sectors because of the existence of the forest sector. And, uh, Can I move? Yeah, uh, yeah, here is a picture of the ripple effects. You can imagine how it works. Uh, for our study, uh, next please. Next? Next slide, please. Yeah, mm -hmm. here is a uh, Basic structure of a social accounting matrix. Uh, next, please. Um, okay. You, uh, you. okay, so you have you seen, I don't know. One. Yes? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I couldn't see them. Sorry. Anyway, a whole country economic contribution. Uh, can we go to the first one? Sorry. Well, um, that one first. Anyway, for economic contribution analysis, can we go to the first one on the methodology side? For economic contribution analysis is based on the social company matrix. Now, the social company matrix is an extension of the input output table widely used in economic analysis. Basically, it shows the flow of goods and services among agents um, within our economy. Mm -hmm. And we already saw, based on the basic structure of a social country matrix, for countries uh, with the, that have the, the social country matrix, we estimate the total economic contribution in terms of value added employment and the labor income. And the total economic contribution includes direct effects, indirect effects, and, the, and the induced effects. And uh, for our study, in addition to the total volume or value of the contribution, we also estimate the economic multipliers of the forest sector. The multipliers give a relative measure about the contribution of the sector. For example, for each dollar generated in the forest sector, how much is the uh, how much um, is generated in sectors that supply materials, machinery, services to the forest sector, and how much is generated in other sectors because of the local spending of the employees. And the main data sources uh, include the 2015 in data, 
in the uh, official country industry statistics, when the data are not available, we use uh, we did estimation based on historical data or a higher level aggregated sector data. For our study, uh, we have uh, implant data for 62 countries, and uh, those are the major uh, first products of producing countries in the world. Um, and for countries that don't have the social accounting matrix, we use an uh, uh, um, econometric model. Dr. Richard May, uh, my colleague here at the University of Georgia, um, uh, he, uh, he constructed the econometric model estimates of four sectors, uh, economic multipliers for each industry, uh, for each industry. Um, and then based on the official statistics on value added in the employment, we estimate the total contribution of the whole sector for those countries without the uh, implant data. And here is, uh, that's pretty much my own comments. Back to you, please. Thank you, Yanshu. So just to summarize, so basically we assess what is the what are the, the, the relationship between the forest sector with the other sectors in the economy, building based on this out input output model uh, and the using a social and account matrix. And with that, we calculate these, uh, uh, the aggregates that I'm going to show now. Um, thank you, Yanshu. Thank you very much. And we're going to then what are the results. So some of the results we have the same already in SOFO 2022. Uh, forest sector total direct contribution to the global GDP in 2015 was six, 661 uh, billion US dollars. When considering the indirect and induced effects, the total contribution reached 1.5 trillion US dollars. So the total economic multiplier of the forest sector value added is 2.3. Uh, the forest and logging has the lowest GDP multiplier when compared with other subsectors, which is uh, 1.97, so significantly lower than the more value-added uh, subsectors. Uh, you can see on the right side of the slide uh, the distributions uh, of the 62 studied countries. I don't know whether you understood well, so we do. We have uh, a firm data, so uh, uh, um, primary source data, data reported by countries for 62 countries which represent more than 90% of the forest production in the world. Uh, for the other countries, we run an economic model to estimate the global, the total uh, uh, global uh, uh, contributions. And here you can see on the right side uh, that the solid wood products is a particularly dynamic uh, 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 subsector uh, together with pulp and paper in the generation of uh, um, value added. Uh, we do the same for employment. So for employment, more than 19.16 million people were estimated to be directly employed in the global forest sector in 2015. Uh, accounting for the indirect and induced effects, the global forest sector supported an estimated, estimated total of 32.4 million jobs in their national economy. So jobs generated in other sectors. And here, um, you can see that uh, uh, when we look into the primary data of the 62 studied countries, we see that the pulp and paper sector for employment is a little bit higher than the solid wood products, but again, they are the two most dynamic uh, uh, subsectors. So what can we learn from these results? Um, you will see in the publication we have this per region, per country, per region, uh, and you can see that in spite of its forest cover, Africa's production is highly underestimated due to insufficient reporting and informality. Basically, only two countries, uh, African countries, have primary data uh, on forest production for, for that we can work through the input-output model, uh, and these two countries are not the main forest uh, producer countries in, in Africa. So that's a very interesting point. Uh, the solid wood and pulp and paper subsectors appear as the most dynamic, and hence that the role of sustainable forest value chains, uh, the role they can play in strategies for sustainable growth and enhanced uh, resilience. And uh, uh, when we look into the indirect effects of the forest sector and employment, we see that uh, 
the fabricated metal products and construction sectors are the ones with quite substantial, substantial uh, indirect effects. So what are our next steps? Um, we see here that this study basically we assess the backward linkers and the forward linkers of the forest sector in the economies. Um, so what we are doing now is doing national studies and doing in-depth in assessments on how, what are these backward linkers, so what are the exact sectors impacted by forestry, and uh, how this transmission pathway, so how the, the impact is transmitted across the different sectors and the different categories in the economy. So we're running now these in-depth assessments for six countries, uh, Brazil, Ghana, Malawi, Finland, Hungary, and Republic of Korea. Uh, so those are in-depth studies, individual studies per country. We cannot do this uh, in aggregated, uh, at aggregated level. And the results uh, will be known by the end of this year. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Yanshu, for the presentation and the collaboration, and the, uh, Natalia and Richard as well. And thank you very much for this, and access the publication today on the website, the FAO website. Thank you. Thais, thank you very much indeed. So forest sector contributions to national economies is there, downloadable and available. A, a, a fountain, uh, a, a mountain indeed of information. So thank you very much indeed for that. It's great to see the next steps that you're going to be taking with those six countries, several of which are represented strongly here during this week. Now, uh, let's move on because I'm delighted to introduce Madame Yoncha Gubelzir from um, FAO and Madame Ratia Lippe from the Tunin Institute in Hamburg, Germany, who have also co-authored a SOFO 2022 background paper. Um, as we prepare to hear from them, I'll tell you a little bit about them. Ms. Gubazir is um, an economist and statistician in the statistics division of FAO, so she's based here. Um, and Dr. Lippe is a senior scientist in the working area of sustainability assessment, forests and society at the Tunin Institute of Forestry in Hamburg in uh, Germany. Fantastic. Okay, so um, Yoncha, I think you're going to start, aren't you? Because FAO have joined forces with the ILO, and we have an ILO representative here on the platform. You'll hear from him in a moment. But a question to you, Yoncha. I mean, please explain why FAO engaged in, in this process before Ratia will then share some results of the research carried out. So over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Harry. Um, so, dear participants, on behalf of FAO and the ILO, and in collaboration with the Tunian Institute, I have, to, I have the pleasure to provide you today with an update on an important topic, uh, which is the number of people employed in the forest sector. Um, as we know, uh, forests are important sources of employment, livelihoods, and incomes for millions of people across the globe. We heard it in the previous presentation as well. Despite the relevance of forests for employment and income generation though, yet we have limited quantitative information on the people employed in the forest sector. So employment related to the forest sector is also part of the global core set of forest indicators developed by the Collaborative Partnership on Forest in 2017 to streamline data collection. So in October 2019, FAO and ILO jointly coordinated a session at an expert workshop within the context of the Collaborative Partnership on Forests. The objective uh, of this session was to review the progress in this indicator and to produce recommendations on the next steps to further develop methodology and increase data availability on employment in the forest sector. Following this expert workshop, the key recommendations included alignment of the employment concept with the International Conference of Labor Statisticians Resolutions to, add, to report on that indicator, and as well as the extension of the forest sector to include not only forestry and logging, but also the forest-based manufacturing, such as the manufacturing of wood and products of wood and the manufacture of paper and paper products. So to fill in the data gap, actually, at a global level, FAO and DILO, in collaboration with Tunin Institute, have joined forces to check feasibility of time series estimations. And we are very pleased that these estimates are now available 
and will be presented by mo my colleague Ratia soon. This is still a work in progress, but we thoroughly trust that the presentation and the related paper that will soon be published will provide a solid basis actually to further improve the employment statistics in the forest sector and these statistics will help to develop evidence-based policies to create more decent jobs to improve livelihoods of millions that rely on the forest sector. So with this, I would like to give the floor to my colleague Ratia from Tinun Institute to give you a snapshot of our current estimates. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Henri. Thank you, Yongsha, for the great introduction. Dear colleagues, to quantify the number of people who work in the forest sector, especially on the global scale, as Yongsha already mentioned, is not a straightforward exercise because the process involves several um, methodological challenge. So in our study, we start our process by defining what is actually the forest sector. In our study, the forest sector covers three primary subsectors, forestry and logging, uh, manufacturing of wood and wood product, and manufacturing of pulp and paper. On the global scale, there are three main data sources that can be used to be estimate the total forest-related uh, employment. Those are FRA database compiled by FAO, the INSTA database compiled by UNIDO, and the IO harmonized microdata. Building on our experience under the Wood Forward Research Project run by the Tunin Institute of Forestry, we found that the IAO harmonized microdata is the most reliable and solid employment statistical database. This is because of the consistent definition of the employment and also the systematic process that the IAO used to produce the employment data. Nevertheless, the high IAO microdata is currently cover the years only in which the labor force survey or similar kind of household survey were conducted. And this results in several missing data points. And for the case of the forest, se forest sector, the IAO microdata cover only the country which is about 30% of the total country around the world. And this doesn't allow us to estimate the global number of the people who work in the forest sector. So with these two main challenges, we developed a method to fill the gap of the missing information and we call it as the web-based method. The web-based method used the ILO model estimate for employment for agriculture and manufacture as a benchmark to fill the missing information. It involved two main steps. The first step, we balance the pioneer data of the country that at least report one point of data for the employment in the forest-related subsector. At the second step, we estimate the employment number for the country. Those are not covered by the microdata using the regional coefficients that derive from the first step and the IO model estimate for employment. Based on our web-based method, we can say that at least 33 million people were employed in the forest sector during the period of 2017 to 2019. And if you see from the figure, this is a share of employment in each forest subsector and total in the forest sector as relative to the total employment in all economic activity. You can see that the share of employment in the forest sector is declining from 2011 until 2019. And there could be two reasons to explain this declining share. The first reason can be because of the increase in productivity due to the mechanization or the improved forest management practices in some country. But the second reason can be also because we use the ILO model estimate as a benchmark to fill the gap of missing information. And the declining share of the employment in the agriculture and also the manufacture would also reflect for the case of the forest sector as well. Now we know that 33 million people were employed in the forest sector, but there are two important aspects that we should zoom in. First of all, how many people were informally employed in this sector? Based on the availability of the data from 56 countries, we estimate that 
There are at least 8 million people were informally employed in this sector and is mostly concentrated in the developing regions like Africa, Asia, and America. The graph shows you the share of formal and informal employment. And the graph already indicates that the informality plays a significant role in these two regions, especially for the case of forestry and logging and the manufacture of wood and wood products. The share of informality exists on average more than 50% of the total employment in this country. Now we go to the male and female employment. We use the available data which are deactivated by the gender from 69 countries, and we estimated that at least 3 million females were employed in the forest sector during the same time period. The graph shows you the share of the male and the female employment in total employment of each country where we have the available data. And you can see from the blue bar graph that the, for, the labor market of the forest sector is still do, male dominated. But if we zoom in into the graph, which might be a bit uh, small, but this is a kind of transparent overlay bar on top of the blue and the green. You could see that in many countries, women are likely to have a higher probability to have informal job, although their employment participation rate is lower compared to the male one. According to our study, I would like to draw your attention on this following conclusion. Our estimated number underlies the importance of the forest sector for the people's livelihood and also the job creation. Therefore, there is a need to ensure that uh, there would be the available and reliable comparable employment statistics and especially disaggregate by gender and by the nature of job. And the data should derive from the uh, employment definition that align with the International Conference Labor Statistical Guideline and Resolution. Our web-based method is already a promising alternative to fill in the gap of the data that are missing or the country that are not covered currently by the microdata. But we are also planning to refine the method to increase our accuracy for the future estimation. From the data user perspective, we also think that the additional research or the in-depth analysis using the IRO microdata would contribute significantly to the data quality verification. And the last point is that all these re recommendations requires a long-term collaboration, the dialogue among different parties, for example, the increase, uh, the continuation to increase the synergy between ILO and FAO, also with the National Statistical Office and Research Institute. At the end of my presentation, I would like to thank the colleague from FAO and ILO for this successful collaboration to complete this uh, piece of work. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ratia. It's wonderful. Thank you very much to Ratia and to Yoncha. Excellent, very strong presentation there. Lots of figures, lots of trends. I mean, working in a very challenging environment where a lot of data is missing, but we did note the huge disparities between global north and global south, and of course between male and female, formal and informal sector. It's going to be interesting to see where these trends go as the data gets more and more accurate over time. So a wonderful collaboration. I think it's now time we heard from the ILO. They've been mentioned several times. It's now time we heard from them. And um, the, our presenter from the ILO is on our far right. Let me tell you a bit about Valtteri Katamayaiki, who works at the Sectoral Policies Department of the International Labour Office in Geneva uh, as a technical officer in, on rural economy with a specific emphasis on the forest sector. And you're also one of the authors of the upcoming FAO, ILO, and UNEC report on occupational safety and health. So the title of your presentation, Occupational Safety and Health in the Future of Forestry Work. Valtteri, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Henry, and uh, thank you for the previous presenters as well. 
it's a, it's, it's a really important work that is being done on the statistical side of things, and especially, as Joncha was mentioning, to see how the statistical information can be used to, to, enable, to enable uh, evidence-based policy responses, of course. From the ILO perspective, we often look at these uh, aspects related to the world of work from the qualitative perspective. So what are some of the issues related to decent work? With decent work, of course, we mean that people are able to work in conditions that are adequate conditions for their work, that they get access to social protection, their rights at work are respected, and that this happen they have access to uh, social dialogue uh, mechanisms. Uh, what we have uh, here is that uh, when we talk about rights at work, we have the, what we call the fundamental principles and rights at work framework, which is a very important one. Because basically these fundamental principles and rights, those are the basic universal rights that every worker should be able to access and benefit from, regardless of their occupation, regardless of the country where they are working, regardless of their employment status. These uh, five categories are freedom of association and right to collective bargaining, the elimination of, of child labor, elimination of forced labor, non-discrimination at work, and very recently included aspect on safe and healthy working environment, which was indeed included in this framework only in June this year by the International Labor Conference, which is the highest level ILO decision-making body consisting of governments, but also representatives of employers and workers. So tripartitely negotiated, uh, negotiated processes. And in this uh, presentation, I'm going to focus, uh, even though I, all of these are, of course, highly relevant to the forest sector, I'm going to focus on the safe and healthy working in environment uh, uh, and occupational safety and health aspects. And uh, one of the reasons why I am going to focus on that is that uh, we have been working with uh, our wonderful colleagues from UNEC and FAO on a report on occupational safety and health and the future of forestry work. Here we have been trying to look some of the changes and trends in the world of work and how they are impacting these uh, occupational safety and health aspects uh, in, in the forestry work and trying to have a little bit of a forward-looking perspective as well. So what are some of the, how, how are these trends going to impact, impact the work? I'm going to briefly run through some of the key findings. This publication is not yet available. We are hoping to be able to release it in the next couple of months or so. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's a big publication, so this is just really a snapshot on some of the key items coming out of the, of the report. First, uh, of course, the biggest challenge of our times, not only from the, from the world of work perspectives, but in general, the climate change. Uh, it's uh, increasing health and safety risks for forestry workers, particularly to those forestry workers who are working outdoors in, for extended periods. And uh, they are, of course, more prone to certain types of accidents and risks because of, for instance, extreme weather events uh, that can cause, as we heard yesterday in the, in the committee, we heard that uh, th there is an increase in intensity and frequency of forest fires, for instance. And this creates uh, safety risks for both, uh, of course, the firefighters who fight on them, but also on forestry workers. Uh, and one of the, indeed, most uh, demanding uh, and most dangerous forest uh, task is the salvage logging where you clean up the forest after, uh, after a uh, 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 disaster. Uh, for workers, of course, uh, likelihood of heat stress. Heat stress is a big topic now, and this is, this is increasing for people who, who spend a lot of time outdoors. And also, this is more prevalent in many countries where workers are engaged in the informal economy, as we were just hearing, and making them already, people, workers who are already vulnerable, this heat stress is particularly impacting, impacting them. And then also climate change has other aspects such as uh, in, frontiers for some, some insects that, uh, that carry vector borne diseases, they are expanding, and this means that there are new risks for people who may not have had those, those risks before. Moving on to demographic uh, changes, here I have uh, just uh, added some groups that, uh, that uh, we are discussing in the report and who all have, are, are facing different kinds of uh, uh, OSHA risks in their, in their work. For young people, we, we hear that in some countries it's difficult to attract young people to the sector, while in other countries we see a lot of uh, an influx of young 
people in rural areas trying to search, search for work. And this means, of course, that sometimes uh, they may, may be uh, employed in uh, unfavorable contracts and also for tasks without sufficient uh, preparation or, or, or uh, uh, equipment, for instance. And for elderly workers that in some countries uh, we, have a, we have an aging workforce, uh, there are some risks related to the, to the physical workload of, of forestry work. Uh, for women, of course, uh, we, we saw from the figures that in some places the participation is indeed, incre indeed increasing. Uh, in silvicultural work, uh, for instance, where we have a lot of women, there is a, uh, exposure to chemi chemicals. And um, then also one major challenge for women is that uh, the personal protective equipment is, is often designed with a middle-sized uh, male worker in mind. And that may, may make uh, the, the PPE that is being provided, that may make it uh, inadequate for, for women workers, for example. Of course, for others uh, as well, but, but, but particular issue, issue for women. And also in some instances, uh, there are some indication that uh, gender-based violence and harassment might be, might be uh, a risk that is, is increasing. For migrants, also a group that, that more and more people, migrant workers are getting engaged. And there, one of the many challenges is related to, to the language barriers, as uh, sometimes uh, they are not able to have uh, access uh, of, of uh, information about safety protocols, for example, or or um, understand their rights at work. And we have some really interesting examples in some countries that uh, are using visualized uh, training materials uh, with, with pictures, very clear pictures on how to, for instance, use uh, safety equipment or how to manage uh, some, some of, the, of, the, of the tools and machinery, for example. Then on the mechanization and digitalization, overall, it, uh, it, I think we can all agree that mechanization improves safety, safety for, for forestry workers. But of course, this needs to come with the right uh, training uh, for, to use some of these uh, new machinery and, uh, and, and tools. Um, uh, the, 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 then in the, in the picture here, we have, for instance, using uh, ICT tools for training workers to face some dangerous work situation already before, through computers, before going to the, to the forest to do the job. Um, GPS, global positioning system, can be very useful in a case of accident, for instance, to, to locate and to provide uh, quick assistance to the worker who, 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 who has an accident in the forest. And then we also have some very interesting examples of using drones for labor inspection purposes. So to be able to access and at least have a, have a look at some of the operations that might otherwise be uh, inaccessible for, uh, for uh, uh, inspectors to, to go because of the, of the isolation and difficult uh, tra road conditions, for example. And then finally, on the work arrangements, uh, uh, there is some evidence that seasonal temporary part-time contractual work may uh, be sometimes inadequately covered by labor regulations and inspection, uh, putting uh, some of uh, these, these workers uh, in, in risks. And as we also heard, the levels of informality in uh, certain countries uh, and regions is very high. And this means that workers may not be able to access uh, labor and social protection. So let me just finish uh, with, with a couple of uh, very key points from the perspective of the International Labour Organization on how the, we, we could address this. First, and this is a very important point from our perspective, is that uh, it's important to put in place, implement uh, legislative and regulatory frameworks based on international labour standards. Uh, this is the, the starting point, the key requirement to, to enable safe working conditions, uh, including for forestry workers. And this includes through the promotion of, of ratification of ILO standards on, on safety and health, but also on other aspects related to, 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 to some, some of the relevant uh, topics. And second, I think we can all agree that occupational safety and health is the responsibility of everyone. And to ensure that we can make use of this responsibility, we need to make sure that everyone's voice is being heard. And this requires strong social dialogue mechanisms where governments, employers, workers can discuss about uh, occupational safety and health related aspects and take action in contexts where everybody's voice is being heard. I think I leave it uh, there for now and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Valtteri. Really good presentation.
these trends are really having a, a very powerful impact on the sector and you can understand why uh, people some people don't want to join it and often those who are, are highly vulnerable to um, the vagaries of the sector it's very very difficult to monitor what's going on and sometimes when you don't monitor then people find themselves in kind of forced labor um, very insecure and sometimes very dangerous conditions which is why you at the ILO are particularly concerned so the new um, book I believe your publication is occupational safety uh, and health in the future of forestry work so that's going to be the new publication coming up. thank you very much to you and thank you very much to all our panelists in the first round thank you very much indeed give them a round of applause Now we are going to move into our second panel and I'm mindful that we are significantly over time. People are overrunning in their presentation. So please let's tighten things up in round two. Otherwise there'll be no time for Q&A. And it's always useful to have at least a couple of questions in so people can respond. So thank you very much to our uh, earlier panelists. Now let me call up our new round of panelists. Let me welcome Marcus Lear, who is a researcher in the Natural Resources Department, the Ministry of Agriculture and Forestry from Finland. Marcus, hello. We have Umberto Navarro de Mesquita, Jr., who is Director of Forestry Research and Information in the Brazilian Forest Service. It's in the Ministry of Agriculture, Livestock and Supply. And we have, I can see, uh, Umberto is, there we are, you're uh, virtual, and so is Vera Steinberg, who is with the Forest Europe Secretariat. Hello, Vera, to you. And on my right is Derek Naibo, who is a member of the FAO Advisory Committee on Sustainable Forest-Based Industries and Chief Executive of the Forest Products Association of Canada. So welcome to you as well. All right, so I'm going to start off with you, Marcus. Um, in round one, in the first part of the event, we learned about some new exciting data, which is, which is great. We want more data, looking at the total contributions of the sector to the economy at global level. I'm interested to hear about Brazil and Finland working together in an in-depth study to further assess how the different economic effects that uh, Thais and uh, Yenshu talked about in their uh, presentation, how they're transmitted through the different economic sectors. So what does this type of data reveal about the forest sector in Finland and um, tell me whether or to what extent the forest sector stimulates sustainable growth and generates jobs in the Finnish economy. Look at that, I'm looking at you hard. Go on. Thank, thank, thank you, yeah. Henry, for, for the question and uh, thank you very much for inviting me and us to this, this panel. Uh, and I would like first to congratulate uh, the co colleagues from the FAO to a very, very interesting report. And then, of course, also to, to the colleagues from the Thun Institute and the I, I, ILO. I did not look at the report of those two, two institutions, but uh, I, I would look, look also in, in that l later on. So in the FAO report, uh, for, from our point of view, we were really interested to know what are these informal or these uh, indirect costs, uh, the, the indirect uh, employment uh, that, that we also have in Finland. I mean, Finland, of course, is very well known as, uh, as a forest, forest sector uh, and we are very, very well advanced. But perhaps we, we need more, more research and here I come from the policy side. Uh, I'm, I'm more interested in, in the data and information on the informal employment mm -hmm. that, that, that we have in, in, in Finland, eh? so that, that would be very, very interesting to, to know and it was very a, a pleasure to work together with the, with the colleagues in, mm -hmm. in, 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 the, in the FAO. Of course, in Finland we have a quite a good um, overview on, from Statistics Finland, what is the employment, but we also know that uh, employment in the forest sector is decreasing uh, to, doing to, or has been decreasing to the past past years, but I will come back to this later. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, and, and explain as a follow up, what are some of the ways in which countries like Finland and other partners can create a coherence between the forest sector and other sectors to promote economic growth for all sustainable, equitable economic growth, and, and also just give us some examples of how Finland considers or takes into consideration 
the socio-economic performance of the forest sector to inform national development objectives and strategies? Because in the end, people want to see it as an investment, not a cost. Quite a long list of questions. I know, I know, but you can you can get the essence of what I'm asking you, you are and reduce it. You are challenged into by time. I, I, I understand. I understand. Yes. Um, um, but perhaps uh, to bring it to a point, uh, Finland has been quite a forerunner in a uh, buyer economy. So in the buyer economy, we try to combine the different sectors, so the primary sectors, but then also the sectors that use the, the material, uh, so the, the industry, to combine them. And uh, we have just recently published our buyer economy strategy, our revised version of the buyer economy strategy, where our main a aim is to get more value added out, out of the, the, the product. Eh? In the previous uh, buyer economy strategy, we focused quite strongly on, on the forest sector, which is uh, quite logical, but now in the new one, of course, we also take other sectors into consideration. And what we had as a base for our new biocommerce strategy was, of course, our strength, but then we also looked to other countries. Eh? We looked to other countries, how are they managing, their, uh, how, how are they doing by, by economy? So we, we published the, the, the strategy, but in relation to that, we also published a research and innovation and development plan. So there will be huge investments from from the Finnish state side to invest in, in new pilot projects, in, 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 in new products. Eh? And you, you may have seen in the, in the main hall uh, some of the, the products that are presented there. Yes, so wood, wood based products. Uh, uh, th this From is, Finland? Yeah, yeah, I, uh, yeah I, I guess it was. Eh? Uh, so, uh, yes, so this is the, the, the way to, to perhaps to go forward to, to replace the, the, the oil based uh, products that we have the packaging. By, by renewable packaging that can be recycled, used again. So, so the Finns, uh, they, they look very much in, in the innovative way how, how, to, how to use. How <laughs> you're to you're use smiling as you talk about Finns. I remember, you know, I'm into my athletics. There was somebody once called the Flying Finn, Lassie Viren. Remember him? Yeah, you see some people are nodding. Yeah, he won the 5,000 and 10,000 meters in 1976, I believe. Anyway, that was by the by. Marcus, for now, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Let's move on to uh, Brazil because Brazil's participating in the uh, in-depth study conducted by FAO and UGA about the contributions of the forest sector to national economies. So let me throw this question to Umberto Navarro de Mesquita Jr. Umberto, I mean, what do forests mean to the national economy in Brazil, I, I would imagine? It's, it's significant. Uh, you're the coordinator of the National Forest Information System. Would you say the results are in line with the information that you collect? And, yes, and um, first of all, I would like to thank you for the opportunity to present a little of what Brazil are doing on the field of uh, forest economy. In Brazil, the contribution of forest sector to gross domestic product is estimated from 1.5 to 3 percent of all of them in Brazil. However, these estimations are not official. Uh, I mean, we have uh, uh, the, the Brazilian Institute of Geography and Statistics is the government body responsible to produce these national accounts. Uh, but for the forest economy, we still don't have a, a forest national account. Uh, besides this, but uh, to produce this information, they need a, a partnership with Brazilian Forest Service. Uh, Brazilian Forest Service produce uh, working together with ABJ are trying to produce the first uh, national forest account uh, on the framework of the system of environment economic accounts. Uh, the Brazilian Forest Service, uh, uh, through the National Forest Information System, organized information of the forest sector along 12 years. Uh, and we have four main components for to produce this information. One of these components is related with the forest resource. Uh, I mean, uh, we estimate all the, the stocks and the, the flows of these stocks, the variation along the time in these resources. Uh, it means for wood and non-wood products. And also we have uh, um, 
another component that is related with the management of the forest, the policies, legislation, the uh, which public bodies are related with uh, forest management in Brazil. Uh, we have another one, the third one, uh, that is the, related with trades and production. Um, then we we, uh, we get all the information from uh, from the, the production, the extraction, uh, the, the the secondary products, uh, the value that uh, is related with this production, exportation, importation, and all the trades uh, related with forests. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, also the jobs. Uh, we also have the information about the forest jobs. We have all the codes organized, what we, we define the forest section. And, and the, the last one is the, related with education and research, that we, uh, we quantify the number of new professionals that is coming to work in this sector. To present this quantity in the products, we have two sources of information. One is the survey of ind industrial production, and also the survey of forest extraction. Then from then, we, we can get information of production and quantify this. And also we have the information about the uh, national forest inventory, together with ans ancillary information from remote sensing from National Institute of Space Research in Brazil, that we can quantify the, the forest resources. And for carbon, we contribute for national report of greenhouse emissions made by Minister of Science and Technology. With this information, we are uh, about to produce this first uh, account information. All right. Thank you very much for the moment, Umberto Navarro de Mesquita, Jr. I did have a follow-up for you, but in the interest of time, I may hold that back. Uh, for if and when we have the chance to do Q&A. But let me move to Vera Steinberg. And, and Vera, you're representing the Secretariat of Forests Europe, the Ministerial Conference on the Protection of Forests in Europe. Um, now, green jobs and forest education, well, they're one of your main work streams. Let's talk about the trends. What trends do you see in the forest sector as a provider of green jobs? People keep going, green jobs, green jobs, green jobs. What do we mean? Thank you, Henry, for giving me the floor and thank you very much for inviting me to this very important event today. Yes, I'm representing Forest Europe today and I can say we have three main work streams. One is on sustainable forest management, one on forest risk knowledge mechanism and the green jobs and forest education. And as, for, as it was already mentioned by Atia, we see the decrease of the traditional forest jobs, at least in the pan-European region. This was also stated by the last State of Europe's Forest, published in 2020. And um, partially the jobs are lost due to the mechanization, but also because they are moved from the European area to uh, countries with a lower salary level. Uh, this is, for example, true for the pulp and paper industry. But at the same time, we must say that fewer younger people are entering the sector. So here comes the forest education in. And this is partly due for the bad reputation actually the forest sector has. We have the slaughterhouse effect uh, a lot. So people want to have nice wooden products. They want to heat with pellets, but they don't want the trees to be cut down. And uh, we also have the situation that the sector was not communicating a lot in the last decades about the fantastic things they do. So what we did within Forest Europe is that we have agreed on a definition for green forest jobs, which embrace not only the traditional jobs, but also new jobs in the forest sector. Because at the moment, there's a huge, huge transition going on and we have new job opportunities coming up. So our definition reads now, green forest jobs provide forest related goods and services while meeting the requirements of sustainable forest management and decent work. So the, the decency of the jobs is very important. And with this definition, we try to embrace the traditional jobs and the new jobs in the sector. And a brief follow up, Vera, thank you for that. Um, so tell us a bit about new and emerging work opportunities in the future. What will be expected from forest education? We've talked a lot about this in the last few days. 
to provide the necessary skills? Because at the moment, there is a skills gap. Yes, um, thank you. We have indeed the situation that we have new jobs coming up, for example, in forest health, but also in uh, sports using the forest in a very different way than they used to, um, or pedagogic in the forests. Um, at the same time, the expectation of the forest education is raising. Um, so we need more flexibility, especially at university levels in the curriculum. Um, and what is needed actually on all levels of education is digitalization. There, there's a huge gap from what is taught in uh, um, at the universities to what is needed in reality. Um, but a lot of especially students complain, for example, that they have a huge lack of soft skills. So they might have fantastic forestry education, but they can't communicate it. So this is definitely something where the sector has room for improvement. And we have another challenge ahead of us, which comes to uh, climate change, because in the future we might need to plant very different tree species in our forests. But uh, the silvicultural sector is uh, maybe not ready to manage these trees. So how do we then adapt in 20 years time to, um, to these new situations if we don't have enough forest workers already now and not enough young people entering the sector? So unfortunately, I have no question yet. <laughs> it's very important to keep the discussion and also the eye on this factor here. Well, thank you very much for answering that question and uh, giving us some humility at the end. You don't have an answer yet, but hopefully we'll get one. Thank you very much uh, to you, Vera. Now to Derek uh, Nybert. Derek, um, uh, the private sector. People often say you can't achieve the targets you want without the private sector. So what are businesses doing to ensure decent work conditions in the forest sector? Because some people fear that if the private sector can get away with it, they will. Yeah, uh, in a Canadian context, that's not acceptable. And I, I think uh, we're blessed in Canada, um, but we, ha we have our issues, of course, but, but we're, we are blessed with a, with a federal charter of rights and freedoms, uh, very robust uh, laws that protect human rights, minority rights, and, and, and the right to safe work. So uh, that said, um, uh, the goal in the private sector is to make sure that every worker goes home to their family at night after their shift. Sure. Um, so, so to make sure that happens as the industry changes, as new machinery and new processes come to bear, uh, staying on top of that workplace training is really, really important. Um, uh, I'd say the other important piece is, is uh, that we're focused on is, is ensure, ensuring that we have a welcoming and safe environment for, um, I think in Canada, I, I was interested in the presentation earlier around the female component of population in Canada, we're probably about 17 or 18 percent of the industry in Canada uh, is female. Mm -hmm. um, but how uh, how can we get that number up to address um, the 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 tight labor market issues? Uh, what are our maternity policies? What are daycare policies? What do transportation policies look like to help uh, women with children get into the workforce and stay in the workforce? So, um, I, and I, I also I, the other thing, I, the last thing I'd add is maybe. That whole of ecosystem, it's not just about the private sector. I, Rob Kozak, who's the Dean of the University of British Columbia's Forestry Department, is back in the corner there with a colleague of his. And I saw another Canadian colleague, Maria, who does youth mentorship with the Sustainable Forestry Initiative and Project Learning Tree in Canada. So there she is right there. Yes. Yeah, so, so I, I, it's, it's nice to see other Canadians here from different parts of that <laughs> ecosystem because we do have to be working together to address some of these issues. Sure, great. Thanks for that, Derek. A quick supplementary. I mean, Vera um, talked a little bit about the new jobs and possible new technologies. Same to you, really. I mean, about the skills that will be required in, in the future to ensure a skilled workforce, especially with the tight labour market conditions you mentioned. Can you share any examples from Canada on how the forest sector is evolving? And perhaps with this new technology, you might be able to increase the number of women in the sector from 17, where it is now, to something more realistic. Yeah, and I'm happy to be sharing the stage with my Finnish counterpart because I think Finland and Canada's northern boreal countries, uh, we challenge each other and we learn a lot from each other. We don't get along at ice hockey, but but in forestry, <laughs> uh, we, we get along quite uh, quite nicely. Um, uh, I, I, I really think there's, um, uh, you know, the bioeconomy like in Finland and Canada is really emerging. Uh, the mass timber agenda. Uh, we say in our industry in Canada that today we have almost as many white lab coats as we do yellow and orange safety vests. Mm -hmm. um, 
And I think what becomes important there is in terms of mass timber, biofuels, bioadhesive, some of these new uh, products and innovations, uh, I think a lot of people might not know about those and might not see themselves with a career in forestry. And I think that's why our universities and other mentorship partnerships are really important. Uh, and visibility does matter. So if we can, if we can increase awareness, and also I, I know, and it's not just Canadian youth, I think it's youth around the world want to see their values aligning with the job yeah. that they're doing. They want to see conservation of biodiversity. They want clean air and clean drinking water. They want to see action on climate change. So, so the opportunity, how do we leverage the mass timber agenda, that bioeconomy agenda, to promote and, and, and use that as a tool to bring more people into our workforce? Very good. Thank you very much indeed, Derek. And that uh, concludes this part of our chat. We're now going to open it up to you and our panelists will remain on hand to respond to your questions. Uh, let me uh, open the interaction with the audience and I know we have Madame Phyllis Menz who's the Ghanaian alternative, alternate uh, permanent representative to FAO. Um, Madame, are you here? I think you may see. Ah, yes, hello uh, to you. Um, let's talk about the collaborative work or between Ghana and FAO, um, looking at the forest sector contribution to the national economy. I understand you have a comment about that that you would like to share with us, especially when it comes to decent work and occupational health and safety in forestry. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bonsu, for giving me the floor. It's my pleasure to share the Ghanaian experience regarding the ongoing study with FEO. Ghana is one of the participating countries of the in-depth study and looking into how the forest contributes to the national economy. As we already know, forests play an important role in the economy and society. And it is important because it's, a good so it's a, an important source of food, fuel, wood, construction material, and even medicinal plants especially for the rural population. The forest sector can help a country make progress towards its economic growth, social well-being, and envir environmental sustainability in many ways to help stakeholders unlock the forest's full potential and to achieve sustainable development. It is important to understand the sector's contribution to national economies. This study also looks, looked at the, or is still looking at the magnitude of measures of economic contributions on value added, employment and labor income through direct, indirect and induced effects to the GDP, the gross domestic product. Bringing such data and statistics of the forest sector to the forefront is crucial to inform policy and investments from both the public and private sectors, and also financial institutions. To achieve this object with the ongoing collaboration between the FAO and the Ghana Statistical Service to conduct an in-depth assessment of the contribution and linkages of the forest sector to our national economy has brought to light the importance of making forest economic activities visible in national accounting matrices, especially through the development of the social accounting metric system. We hope that this work will equip our forestry institutions, that's the Ghana Forestry Commission, the Ghana Statistical Service, and other stakeholders with new and updated knowledge and skills about innovative ways to look beyond the forest sector and to contribute it's um, economic multipliers and sectoral linkages into national strategies, policies, okay. and programmes for the development of the forest sector. Madam Phyllis, I'm going to have to let you land now. Thank you. <laughs> uh, any Ghanaian that I pause, I always say I'll let you land. Every Ghanaian knows what that means. It means I should wrap up now and leave them wanting more, as we said. Thank you so much for that. It's great to see that the Ghanaians are enthusiastic partners and collaborators in this study, and we'll get more and more data, and it's going to be more and more accurate, and hopefully more and more people can be attracted to well-paid, sustainable, safe jobs in, in the sector. Do we have a further brief comments? Um, or questions to our panel, because our panelists are here and they're also online. So if you want to 
say something or ask a question. If not, I will circle back and ask more questions of our colleagues. Speak now, as I always say, or forever hold your peace. Let me, let me ask you, Marcus. Um, how well do you think the opportunities for safe, decent employment in the forestry sector, how well is it communicated in Finland? Because we've heard all week that it's not done very well across the board, despite the hard work of the Forest Communicators Network and others. Well, perhaps uh, Valtteri is, is the better person to answer that from, from the ILO. Uh, well, I, I think it is... Uh, and uh, Valtteri can correct me. I think it's not such much an issue because it is very well handled. Huh? So if something well, is well, well handled, then it is not an issue. At least from my side, I, I would, I would not see that. But of course, uh, in 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 the in, in the light of climate change and also uh, the, the 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 severe uh, forest events that we will perhaps face in the future, we also have to talk about uh, safety in in the forest sector. So to on on the harvesting side and. So uh, but uh, yeah, I, I would say it's not an issue because it is well handled. But uh, somebody else can me can challenge me and tell me a different different story. All right, let, let me throw this to Umberto in, in in Brazil. Maybe I can put that question to you: How well communicated is the forestry sector as an industry and as a potential opportunity? Because when I it's here in Italy or living in the UK, think of Brazil. I just think of one of the lungs of the world, the forest, the density, the biodiversity, and perhaps the massive contribution, I thought, to Brazil's economy. But you told me it was around 1.5 to 3%, according to the latest figures. Um, can you explain some of the challenges when it comes to dealing with forest production and economic data, especially when you want to perhaps change public policies aimed at the sustainable use of forests? Challenges in Brazil. Yeah. Okay, and uh, we have uh, in Brazil good statistics for wood products because we have a lot of uh, regulations, control to, to, to this part of, uh, I mean, the for, national, for natural forests. And also for planted forest, that is the biggest contribution for all the, the production and also the, the value that is at around the fifth, uh, 15 million. Uh, and also for natural forest, we have about 4, 4 billion annual production. Uh, but uh, what I think it's the main challenge in the, the, the statistics is related with non-wooded products. If we consider 10 years of uh, uh, um, time, from 10 years to now, it increased about to seven times the production of non-wood products in, in Brazil. And also we, uh, we have, uh, uh, if we consider the value, it's bigger than this, which means that the, the the demand for non-wood products is bigger than what we can produce, like acai, like uh, uh, Brazilian nuts. And also, we have a, a, with National Forest Information System, uh, National Forest Inventory, we have a uh, social uh, survey, what we interview people. With 10,000 people that we interview, uh, uh, the people said that for 30 per 30, uh, 37 percent of these people said that the forest contributes for uh, the, the amount of um, money of for family and uh, from this 37 uh, uh, 15 percent it's more than 50 percent of this uh, the, the the money that they they uh, the contribution of the, 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 the money that they have. Uh, it means that uh, non-wooded products have a good contribution for the forest and it's, it's increasing in Brazil, the use of that. But the problem is we, we still, we have about uh, six, uh, 60 products that we have a survey. 
but we still underestimate uh, the production, the value, and then we are working to improve these estimations because this is really increasing in Brazil and there are a lot of jobs and economic importance uh, for the people that live together with people. Yeah, and as a result of that underestimation and lack of hard data, uh, people often think, well, the forest is just there, it's natural, it will always be there, and they don't value it sometimes, um, except maybe as a resource to clear and then to plant and to put cattle on and all of this stuff we've been seeing in Brazil over the past few years, although that may change, who knows, let's wait and see in a few weeks' time, perhaps, who knows. Um, I watch the news too. Um, do we have another uh, thought or question from the floor? If not, I have a follow-up for Vera. Uh, okay, forever hold your peace. Uh, Vera, I'm just looking at um, this ministerial conference on the protection of forests in, in Europe. What is at the very top of your agenda for that conference, for you as a secretariat? What keeps you awake at night? Well, how we can protect and sustainably manage our forests in Europe, of course. <laughs> Um, well, the next ministerial conference will take place in 2024 at the end of the German championships, championship. So we still have a little bit of time to think about the, the main targets we want to have at this conference. But for sure, the criteria and indicator for sustainable forest management within the pan-European area is one of the main focus areas um, because this is a dynamic concept. But Forest Europe agreed on the definition of sustainable forest management in 1993. So we are still building on this, being aware that it's a dynamic concept with, which has to be always um, checked for the conditions which we have now, because they are different to what we had in the beginning of the 90s. So I would say this is one of the, the main targets of Forest Europe, where we also think that, um, we are the custodians of this sustainable forest management in the pan-European area. Thank you, Vera. I see Maria from Canada is there, representing young people in Canada and, and young people globally for the purpose of, of this situation. Your response to what you've heard, because uh, you know, Derek called you out in a positive way. So I'm just wondering what you think as somebody who wants to transform the sector, highlight opportunities, get more young people in and, and change the, the way it is perceived. What do you think of what you've heard? We've got a microphone to you. Thank you. Yeah, um, I guess from a youth perspective, it's just been really inspiring to hear what is going on both at a regional and high level. Um, I think as youth, we have a lot of power and we need to be heard by leaders um, on platforms like this. So yeah, I, I just think it's a really neat opportunity to be able to hear from you guys and also get to be a bit of a voice for some of the youth in Canada as well. Great, thank you very much indeed. I've got to go back, to, circle back to you on that, Derek. So, so what, what, what's next? What, what, what's um, at the top of your agenda at this point? Yeah, well, um, one of the big areas beyond working directly with youth is our relationship with organized labor in Canada. I think we're a heavily unionized sector, but you know, our organization just recognized United Steelworkers as one of the biggest organized labor groups in the country as being one of our top partners last year. So, so I wanted to add that to, I think, I think that relationship with, with labor, although there's always going to be tension at collective bargaining time, and that's, that's just part of the game, but I, but I do think a close working relationship to support young workers and, and worker rights is absolutely critical. Um, it's a, it's labor crunch in Canada. It's every, every industry is fighting for talent and, and we're seeing a real boom in the mining sector. I think this critical minerals agenda is really taking the world over, electric batteries. So, so we are competing not only with a very strong oil and gas sector, but also a, a, a mining sector in Canada that's on the rise. So competing um, in a way that's just not around dollars, but around those values. And I think, I think the more especially young people can see their values reflected in the job that they're doing and know that they're making a contribution uh, to their community is, is, is a real differentiator for us that I, think, that, that I think we can leverage further. So that's one of the things. The other thing that Maria works on, and I'm, a big, uh, I'm a very, very passionate about, is mentorship. Uh, people need to see themselves in these jobs, and that starts with, with, with leaders in the industry and, 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 and frontline workers who are going to take the time with young people to talk to them about their experience. So I think maximizing that mentorship and formalizing and expanding that mentorship program across Canada is a big priority. Yeah, because I think for a lot of people, younger people particularly, 
they just don't see that they don't know what jobs are available they don't see it i mean when you look at other industries um or the big ones that employ huge numbers of people whether it's banking whether it's the health service you know in, and the health service in nearly all countries is probably one of the biggest employers in social services etc they know exactly what those jobs are what they look like and what the pathways into them are when it comes to this sector a lot of the time they don't really know i mean what, what is the low-hanging fruit what are the qualifications you would need to take what you know at 18 at 21 or if you don't want to take formal qualifications what are the apprenticeship routes and these are some of the areas that, that, that are difficult i'm sure go, yeah go on. Well, i was just going to say or am i going to be welcome if yes. i'm a woman am i going yes. to be welcome if yes, i'm yes. new to canada settling in northern ontario is are, are my co-workers going to accept me if i'm a gay or lesbian canadian am i going to be safe in my workplace so so as a gay canadian myself i take i'm very very passionate about working in a traditionally white male industry um a straight white male industry mm -hmm. to talk about the opportunity and 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 i take that as a responsibility but i know colleagues of mine from other parts of the canadian population feel the same way so yeah. i think seeing yourself and Marie will know this, but like, you, like that helps so much knowing that you have a home and there are others like you in, in, in the workforce. All right, thank you very much indeed for that. Um, we've got just enough time for one more response or comment from the floor. Otherwise, I'm going to hand over to the maestro who's going to help wrap us up for the final part of this session. The maestro knows who he, knows who he is. <laughs> no? Okay. Oh, yes, we do have a question or comment from over there. Tell us who you are and uh, make your point briefly. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for giving me the floor. I'm uh, actually an intern here in FAO uh, Forest Based Bioeconomy Team. My name is Karen Beraja and I'm actually from Canada as well. The so Canadians my... have taken over. The Canadians <laughs> are coming. My question is quite simple. It's uh, as the DG said last time at the youth event, how can we make the jobs more attractive, more sexy, the forestry jobs and uh, anyone who wants to answer can. More attractive, more sexy. Ah, that, that, that doesn't mean he's sexy. Marcus, over your thoughts. You, you choose the, the least sexy for <laughs> answering, uh, answering that. No, but uh, I mean, talking of my own experience, I, I studied forestry in, in the late 90s. And uh, when we started to study, we were told by the professors that uh, you will never find a job. Huh? <laughs> Because, yeah, because it was the time of uh, the economic uh, depression and so on. So, so all the students sitting there, and they were like, oh. but I have to see that uh, where you, you have to find, find your way, uh, what, what you would like to do. You have to, to see your strength. And uh, for some, it's the strength to go to the traditional way in, in the forest administration. For some, it is go, going to, to international. So I think it's uh, finding your, your, your own strength. And of course, that the sector can, can it make itself very active attractive with, uh, I, I don't know, good salary and, uh, and so on. But uh, it, it is also where, where you find yourself at home. Huh? Uh, I mean, salary is, of course, a big issue, but it's not all. Huh? You also, you have to feel, like uh, Derek said, you, you have to feel welcomed in the community. So I, I think it is about that. And sometimes in life, it is just about the, the small opportunity, window of opportunity that's open. You have to jump on it. And sometimes it, it, it's, it's working and sometimes not. So it's not only about the, the industry or the sector that has to make itself attractive, but you yourself, perhaps as a person, as an individual, you also have to make yourself interested in, in what, you, what you are doing. Mm. I don't know if that makes sense. And maybe sense. if the job that you want isn't there, you can create that job uh, yourself. Yeah, 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 yes, uh, Henry just said it. Huh? Could be. Uh, yeah, perhaps. I, don't I mean, know. I never knew when I was at university studying German and French 30 years ago that there was a job called moderator. I had no idea. I thought I was going to be an interpreter at the EU. Anyway, that was before Brexit. Fantastic. Okay. So let me wrap up and thank um, our colleagues. So, Marcus Lea, Umberto Navarro de Mesquita Jr., Vera Steinberg, and Derek Nyberg. All states stay here and stay there. Thank you very much. That was a really lively and engaging second round of panel QA and conversation. Thank you very much. I would now like to give the floor to Mr. Sven Walter, team leader in charge of the FAO work streams on the forest based bioeconomy, forest food and nutrition, as well as livelihoods production and trade statistics. I saw Sven, as usual, brow furrowed head bowed, scribbling away, trying to find a way of highlighting and capturing the essence, the energy 
of what has been discussed here over the past one and a quarter hours. So Sven, it's a big challenge, but I know you can deliver. Thank you, Henry. That's mission impossible. But yeah, let us make and let us keep the sector attractive. I mean, yes. there was so much passion here in the room and I think people are excited. So I think we can transmit this message, Karim, you know, to different people and we have to advocate yes. and make the case for forestry from all our different perspectives. I myself, I'm a geographer, but still I'm happy and proud to work in the forestry sector. There are so many key messages to bring out and you stop me eh, when, we have to stop, uh, when we have to go. I mean, one is really looking into the panel, the partnership. We have the private sector, we have academia, we have policy processes, we have the countries. Whom did I forget? I mean, ILO, the international organizations, the youth. So we need to work together. And uh, I think uh, seeing the study, Thais, you presented and our joint work, we are still progressing. We are progressing. And let's be proud of it and let's showcase that we are doing so. Then I noted some, some numbers, 1.52 trillion. Impressive to see you know, the multiplier effect from the forestry sector. So that's again a story, Karim, to tell that, I mean, we are contributing to economic growth. 33 million, Ratia, you mentioned it. So the forest sector matters, employment matters. And seeing in particular that we are getting even better data in future because we are working together. I think that's again something we can, we can, show, uh, we can showcase. And then, of course, having all the aspects Valtteri mentioned on occupational safety and health. And we saw that there are many trends going on. Mm -hmm. We heard about climate change, mechanization. But at the end, what did you say? It's a responsibility of all of us. So that's, again, something you know, we have to ensure when we, when we talk about forestry and forest development that however decent work remains our main objective and framework in which we are operating. Then we went to the panel discussions and I mean, it was so interesting from, from Finland to hear again the issue of bioeconomy. We showed a film on Tuesday, again on Finland and the bioeconomy, so that's impressive. But still, Finland, like other countries, I mean, there's this issue of informality. How can we address it? How can we get the information? I know that Ratia, Jörg, when we are working on this, you, you, sometimes you ask Vera about sleepless nights. So informality is sleepless nights for yes. us to see how to get you know, this data. Yeah. From Brazil, it was so interesting to hear about, yeah, we have good, you have good data, but then there's still the issue of the national accounts of forestry, which are missing. And obviously, from our team who are working on non wood forest products, it was important to hear you know, how important this sector is. Demand is raising. You have some good information, but we need better information. And that's something, again, where we are helping countries to do so. Vera, that was really the issue of green jobs. I did not down the, the definition, but people can find it on the internet. But we saw there again, you know, this importance of forest education. In particular, now when we see the emerging forestry sector, there are new jobs coming up. And as she said, you know, university digitalization, there is where we have to invest. We have to invest into the future and we have to communicate. You mentioned the slaughterhouse effect and with our guys also here in FAO, we are trying to improve communication. And again, that's a joint responsibility of all of us. And I think, Derek, you mentioned it. You talked about communication, mentorship, spreading out um, you know, the voice, and then using these processes like bow economy, mass timber. I think these are sexy topics. We can showcase you know, what forestry can do and with this, we can do a workplace of choice within the forest sector. So I do believe there are many points we found and which we should, again, communicate to the outside world. But to wrap up, forest employment, forest sector is emerging. We have trends like climate change and so on, where forestry is not the problem, it is the solution to it. But forest employment need to provide the skills actually to tap and to make this solution a reality and to upscale good practices and it's in transition to a new bioeconomy so there again you know we have new products new skills and we have new opportunities so we need to adapt but while adapting what do we need to do we need to secure safety and occupation and health in the system in order to ensure that when we talk about the forestry sector we talk about decent and sustainable work so let's try to get out the message um, showcasing a sexy forestry sector so that we can move ahead all together and contribute actually to sustainable development altogether.
Henry, that's all that I can say. You and have a delivered, uh, Sven Walter. I set you a very high bar, but you have achieved it. Give yourself a round of applause, and everyone give Sven a round of applause. Thank you very much Thank indeed you, to Henry. Sven. Thank you very much indeed to the panel and to you for staying the course. So that concludes Beyond Numbers, Income, Employment and Decent Work in Forestry. This special World Forestry Week side event. Thank you very much indeed. Enjoy a late lunch and the rest of the day, the rest of the week, and Rome and life. And see you at some point in the near future. Thank you very much indeed.